Now, when one thinks about Latin presentation, one name springs to mind, a great champion of the past, whose artistry is still remembered and talked about. I would like, ladies and gentlemen, for you to try and imagine a particular scene, a particular situation, which happened just about here. about 20 years ago. It was in fact the morning of the British Amateur Latin Championship and I was standing just here during the morning practice session. Sitting just about here was a very well-known and respected Latin dancer and coach by the name of David Douglas. And for some reason, during the course of the practice, I had noticed several people doing a new move. In fact, I'd seen this once or twice before in competitions beforehand. Never thought about doing it, but uh, it seemed to be quite successful. So on that particular morning, on the morning of the British Amateur Latin Championships, I stood here and a Paso Doble was playing, and I thought, well, I should have a go at that, because I thought I could do it okay. So David Douglas was sitting there, so I came over here, around about here, and the entry to my Paso Doble used to be something like one, two, 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 and three, two, four, two, five, two, six, two, seven, two, eight, two, and Lynn used to spin in, and I used to catch her in a drop. So it occurred to me that this new trick which I'd seen a few people doing, would fit very nicely in there. So I thought, well, I have a go at that. So, there we were. And off we go. One, two, three, two, three. I did this jump, and I landed on my knee, and I slid back without much control, and I finished over here somewhere. So I said to David Douglas, I said, that look all right. He said, Christ, that's so terrific. I said, well, should I just do that tonight in the competition? He said, it will be fabulous, you have to do that. I thought, all right, well, I'll do that. So, out we come, and off I go in the evening, and I took off, and with a bit of luck, this thing worked quite well, and I ended up, as I said, over here. And this got quite a response from the audience. Now, the reason I tell you that is a little prelude to something else, which is that one or two years later, still dancing the same old stuff, no changes, I came over here, and by this time it was about the third round of the British Professional Latin Championship. And I think I can say that with some assuredness that the people sort of were, were interested to see what would happen at this point with this jump. So I prepared myself and I took off and I really went for this thing and I slid back again and I sat straight down on my backside. I was absolutely astonished. This had never happened before. The 
crowd enjoyed this. I wasn't enjoying it very much at all. And as I'd finished, Lynn hadn't quite started yet to turn in, so I just got up, you see. And I walked back over here. And I thought, well, I'll do this again and try and get it right. So <laughs> off I went. And this time I gave it everything I had and I slid back and I was over here. And I fell flat on my ass again. I was very irritated by this time. So I got up again, and I walked back over here. Now, you see, the thing was, you'll remember now, we were about 35 bars through the Pass of Oble. I hadn't got going yet. So I thought, this is really too terrible. So now off I go again, and off I, and here it goes. I'm up there somewhere. Well, it felt like up there. I don't think it quite was. And now I'm back here straight on my ass. <laughs> now by this time, Lynn had really had enough of this and she decided, she, so she was turning in. So I caught her and I turned around and we stopped and I started again. We're now about 45 bars through the Paso Doble. So this time I thought, well maybe if I change the direction I'll be all right. Off I went, here we go. Up, we're past the first highlight now, we're way on to the end of the dance. Discretion was the better part of valor. I thought, well, I'll try and play this one a bit safe. And lo and behold, I landed correctly. The result was, the place was screaming. I'll tell you another story. We'll come back to that in a second. Remember that one. Things, a lot of things seem to happen down this end. I don't know why. I remember on one particular occasion, again about 20 years ago, the British Amateur Championships, finishing the Paso Doble here. And we finished the dance. I looked around and I realized that this was not the best position for me to be in. There were several couples near me. There were a couple of couples in the center. And down at the far end, there was only one couple. So at this time, normally when you finished your dance, you stood where you were and you carried on. There wasn't too much else to do. So immediately I took a decision, that's where I had to be. So I took Lynn's hand and we started to walk. And we walked. And when you're out here, ladies and gentlemen, it is a bloody long walk. <laughs> the interesting thing was that as we walked, don't stop there because it's in front of the speaker. As we walked, for whatever reason, there was a tremendous response from the audience right the way down the room. And we arrived at this end. And by the time we arrived at this end, the room was in an uproar. Because the other couple standing there was Alan Hazel Fletcher. We danced the jive. And I think that that particular final is quite memorable in the minds of people who saw it as being one of the most exciting that have taken place here. Now, why am I telling you all this stuff? I mean, there's all this memorabilia and history. <clears throat> there's a reason. Because the first topic in this business of Latin presentation, as it relates to today, is 
presentation on the competition floor. It's becoming very difficult as a coach or as a teacher to divorce the requirements of dancing from being competitive. And there is no doubt that to be successful as a competitor, one does need to develop a certain sense of skill in how you present what you do. And this is not just presenting the dancing, the steps. This is presenting yourself, presenting the work you are doing to a public, to an audience, in the correct way. Now the reason I mention these two particular things is that it may be very difficult for people to believe, but both of those things occurred absolutely spontaneously. They occurred at that moment. They occurred with no planning. There was no scheme. It was not a stunt. It was not done to make the audience go mad. It was done purely and simply because when I kept falling over, the first thing that came into my mind was, well, you better get up and do that right, otherwise you're going to look a bit silly. When I stood here in that split second, and I think it hadn't really been done before, and turned around and decided to walk to the end of this floor, it was a spontaneous decision. Whatever result that gave in terms of appreciation or response was very nice. But it was not the intention. I feel very strongly about this. Because I have had the unfortunate experience of dealing with some very very successful people who have in fact come to ask my advice on these type of things and upon hearing from me that if you decide three weeks before you go to an event that you intend to fall over on the floor and then get up and repeat the move three times that this isn't really what it's about were really very upset because it was beyond their comprehension they could not understand that you could possibly be so confident so clear so at ease with what you were doing that you would be able to do that without some particular plan or some particular uh, idea of trying to cause a sensation. Many of you remember seeing duels between Peter Eggleton, Brenda Winslow, Bill and Bobby Irvin, the famous hovering duel. These things were not planned. They were the ability of people in command of what they were doing to be able at that moment on the competition floor to respond to what was required. It's sad because I've heard it with my own ears that some people now feel that this should not be the case. That we have to indulge in some peculiar one-upmanship to gain the affection of the audience and the result from the judges. And many of them have learned over the past year or so, the affection of the audience cannot be bought. It's even when they don't like you and they're screaming that you have achieved something. This is something given 
by the public because they recognize something genuine and something worthwhile. It rarely now gains recognition in planned stunts or silly shows of one-upmanship. I had the very unfortunate task of standing, it wasn't down that end this time, it was over here, having to judge at this very event several years ago and being forced to make very, very difficult decisions, spontaneously I might add, and not planned. When several couples decided to implement the use of props into competitive dancing, I took a very dim view of this, and my marks reflected it. And I took a dim view because I felt, well, if one guy can do it, so can everybody else. And what happens when we get to the first round of the youth competition and we suddenly find that people are coming out with all sorts of bits and bobs and trying to show you how clever they are with the various accoutrements they were putting on and where are we going to stop that and how are we going to control it? So I had to take a very difficult decision and my decision was that I would not condone that under any circumstances regardless of the skill of the dancer. Because this was entering into something unknown. Entering into something unknown which I personally felt was an incorrect direction. The conclusion of this is not what certain couples do or don't do. It is not even that young couples may or may not copy those things directly. The conclusion is the perception. It is the perception which is fostered amongst people in general that somehow these things become necessary as one nears the top. And I hope as we proceed a little bit this morning that I can help to convince you that this is completely unnecessary and completely untrue. I want to touch briefly on the idea of presentation in relation to dress. Now this is a very extravagant waistcoat. This waistcoat, very nice. It sort of even goes with the outfit. I don't like it. It's not even mine. I borrowed it. And I borrowed it because I think I could walk around here and look all right, you know, you say, oh, is it a nice waistcoat? Keeps his waist in a bit, you know, but it doesn't look so tubby if he's if he got this on. I tell you what I'm going to do with this waistcoat. I'm going to take it off. The reason I'm going to take it off is because it is superfluous to my requirements. It doesn't help me with this lecture. I felt much the same as a dancer. Indeed, most of the great dancers I've known have gone to the most unbelievable lengths to make sure that the costuming they choose does not get in the way 
of what they are trying to do as performers. When I first started to compete, when I competed here first, we were wearing dinner jackets. The nature of the costume tended to dictate the style of dance. If I put my arms above my head in this jacket, <laughs> this is not exactly what you would hope to see from someone who would like to be the British champion. The simple, straightforward answer, of course, is don't do it. Keep your arms here. Keep your arms on a level where this looks good. Unfortunately, life's not so simple. Inevitably, as Latin America grew in popularity and people wanted to contribute to its development, new ideas, new concepts came in and the use of more extravagant arms, the use of solo choreography developed, and suddenly the dinner jacket really didn't seem appropriate anymore. In response to that, one or two brave souls ventured onto the competition floor in the catsuit. These things were unbelievable. They had actually stood up by themselves. They were, in Wally Laird's favorite phrase, the boiler suit look. I think I was about the second or third competitor to go onto the competition floor in a cat suit. Now the ones, as I said, that I'd seen before, and the ones which were made generally, really did. They stood up by themselves. They were so thick, they were made of this skiing material. And I saw this on a man called Patrick Johnson at a competition in the glamorous Walthamstow Town Hall. And I thought this was absolutely wonderful. So I immediately ran to my tailor, good old Billy McKenzie, and I said, I, I want one of those, and I want it done like this. And it was really quite interesting, you know? It was interesting because I knew exactly what I wanted and why. And the reason was because over a long period of time, I had a very clear image of how I wanted to look. And suddenly I could see a way of actually making that better, of making it clearer. The second time I wore this very absolutely plain black fitted catsuit was at a competition in Germany in the town of Pforzheim. This competition was known to be a difficult competition. People had said to me, well, you, you really have to, you know, make sure you dance well and present yourself. And so wearing this rather revolutionary outfit was really a little dangerous never entered my head not to do it because I was sure that wearing that was going to make my dancing better. I also wore it with an open neck shirt. Up until that time, even cat suits were worn with bow ties. After the competition, there was an article, I can't remember if it was in Tan Spiegel or the other German magazine with a picture of me, not a very flattering picture I hasten to add, with a headline, is this the future of Latin dancing? The article was not very complimentary, but I would like to tell the gentleman that wrote the article that yes, that was the future of Latin dancing. <laughs> There's a reason again for telling you that story. The reason for telling that story is that 
in the Latin American business, we seem to be obsessed with the idea of how people look. I think it is absolutely essential that one dresses and one prepares oneself cosmetically, physically, as well as one can, because if you do that, there is a good chance you will feel better. If you feel better and you feel comfortable, then you may well dance better. But I think it's not unfair to say that we have somehow, in the perception of couples, and sometimes in the results, seen a somewhat of a switch in the last few years where this idea of how you look has assumed an unbelievable significance. It has become so important. And I don't know why. I'm so confused. If you choose a beautiful dress, wonderful, long, sophisticated evening dress. You go to a banquet or you go to a reception. This tends to denote a certain requirement in the way you stand, in the way you greet people, in the way you behave socially. Unlikely that if you put on this wonderful outfit, a beautiful dinner jacket, that you, you walk in and you're going to the garden party with the Queen and you come in like this. Automatically, what you wear says something about the way you conduct yourself. But I'm always confused when I see these beautiful women in the most fabulous gowns, beautifully made up, dancing the most inappropriate and ugly steps with open crutches and gyrations. And it's very difficult for me to put the two together. If you have a style of dancing which that type of action becomes the form, it's very easy to choose a costume which works with that. If you choose something very sophisticated, then it's very easy to choose a style of dancing which is consistent with that. The only problem I think that I have and the general public has sometimes is when they see these things not quite gelling together. And I would like to see in presentation a very clear and a very considered use of costuming to contribute to what the dancer is trying to say. This leads me to the next point, the presentation of dancing. How can you pick a costume which works if you don't know what you're doing? This may seem unkind, it may seem unfair, but I, I deal with it. A lot of people in this room deal with this all day, every day. It's our job. It's difficult to believe couples can get into such a state. I have always contributed my success as a dancer, ladies and gentlemen, to one very simple thing. The best teaching available. To the age of 16, I was taught by one lady, June McMurdo, in Borman Latin, and enjoyed enormous success. I won't bore you with all the details of that. I came to this very festival at the age of 15 and won the British Junior Youth Borman Latin four weeks after coming out of the junior section with Walter Laird as my Latin teacher, Latin coach, I should say, and Benny Tormeyer as my ballroom coach. That was the combination of people for the next three years, during which time we won quite a lot of things. 
then also studied Borum with Bill Irvin and latterly towards the end of my career with Doris Lavelle in Latin. So during my entire competitive career, I had five teachers. This spanned 16 years. Started five years old. The teaching never stopped, was never interrupted, was never contradicted. I was never confused. So when all these other things about presentation came along, I had something, a vehicle, I had a technique, I had an understanding of music, and so you were secure. When you're secure, you can be encouraged by people with brilliant open minds to develop a sense of your own purpose. And this has got to be the greatest joy in this form of dance. It is the expression of two individuals free to give a spontaneous performance of what they want to do at a given time, at a given place. This brings me to the idea of how do you make a couple competitive? I have to tell you that if I see a couple practice, as I often do at the assembly in London, and for example, the lady goes to fan position and she arrives in a perfectly acceptable position and she now proceeds to practice her feeling. She is going to practice her feeling. She practices her feeling by establishing a position which is then accompanied by a facial <laughs> expression. This may very well be her feeling at that moment. The problem is, how does that work three weeks later on the floor in Blackpool? You can be filled with sensual and sexual desire in the assembly ballroom if you come for practice during the week because the music's very good and you'll enjoy it enormously. And how does that apply when you go to a competition in let's say a rather unatmospheric sports hall somewhere and you are filled with your feeling which you've practiced and the music comes, and it sort of goes, la da 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 da, da 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 da. You are in big trouble. You're in trouble because there is no sex in that music. You are going to look bad. We have just a simple little fan position, which goodness knows, everybody that knows anything in, in this room knows exactly what they're doing. The skill, the joy, the cleverness, the beauty in what we do is the ability to hit that position and for the feeling in relation to the atmosphere and in relation to the music to come out. As soon as we choreograph and impose feeling, you curtail any individual artistic and emotional progress. <coughs> if you put a cap on it, it doesn't grow. This is a very difficult conundrum for coaches. 
We cannot have couples simply walking out onto the floor with no competitive awareness if they wish to be successful. But on the other hand, as soon as we give them the gesture, as soon as we give them the face, when do we go back and start to develop their own ability to be interpretive? The answer is never. And it's my view very strongly that those people are the poorer for that. It is not the function of competitive Latin American dancing to be a finite art. It cannot be a finite art because the given conditions, the given circumstances are not exact. I've been very fortunate, ladies and gentlemen, to work with some very, very brilliant people in the theater. I know the lengths to which they go to achieve perfection. And I think I have an idea of what that perfection is. You will never achieve that level of perfection on a competitive floor. You may achieve a level of perfection, not that exact level of perfection, and who wants it? That is not what we do. The joy, the beauty, the skill, the cleverness of the brilliant people you see on this floor is their ability to work for that moment, at that moment, with the freedom and the skill to make it work in relation to the atmosphere, in relation to the music, from round to round and dance to dance. This doesn't mean that just anything goes. The structure within which that spontaneity exists must be perfect. The greatest command of technique available, the greatest demand of musicality, the greatest command of rhythmic skill, the greatest command of partnering, the greatest command of choreography. And yet, within all that, there must be space for individual expression. Now, I hope you'll forgive me for having talked for so long. But I am coming back later this afternoon to help Lorraine with her lecture. It just seems to me that these things are so important to try to encourage a perception of what Latin American competition dancing is about, which is not based on look, which is not based on stunts. The best example I can give you, ladies and gentlemen, is this week, I have to stand here and judge. And I cannot help but feel that when I stand, as I usually do, sort of somewhere over here, on Wednesday night, a lot of people may assume that the criteria which I'm going to use to assess that event are in some strange way different to the criteria I'm going to use to assess the event on Friday. On Friday, I will ex be expected to look primarily for an exquisite quality of action, for superb style, for great musicality. I would be viewed as being very strange indeed if I was particularly worried about the hairstyle of any of the ladies in the final of the British Professional Ballroom Championship. 
Apart from the unlikely event of one of the gentlemen coming out with a hump on his back through a poor tail suit, it would be very strange for me even to comment on the dress of one of the gentlemen in the British professional Latin championship. And I know from experience that when I talk to ballroom judges, if you refer to the lady who was wearing the pink ostrich feathers, by and large, they don't know who you mean. If you say, don't you remember the girl with the terrible ankles? They go, oh yes, that one. The first thing that people say to me when they refer to couples in Latin is, oh, you must remember that girl. She was the one with the fabulous blue. I go, who? You're the girl in blue. I... Girl in blue? You mean the one with the heel leads and the chasse cape in the wrong place? That's the one. I don't see the problem. I think this business of presentation is enormously important. I can honestly tell you that when I stand here and I judge on Wednesday night, I don't think I'm going to have to go far enough down the list of criteria in terms of technical excellence, musicality, rhythmic interpretation, partnering, choreography, characterization, to begin to consider what they are wearing or how they look. It is automatically given. If the performance is superb and the dancing is excellent, it is likely that the costuming is contributing to that end and is not going away from it, diverting from it, or otherwise interfering. I remember very quickly, I think I'm running out of time. I remember, ladies and gentlemen, again standing on this floor just when I had become an amateur. There was a couple dancing. I was in the room, right about here. In those days, everyone said, you've got to dance in the middle. You've got to dance in the middle. What an idea. Everyone dances on the audience now. We dance in the middle. And you know why? They said, because you'll be seen. You'll be seen? Who's going to see you in the middle? The judges. That's who's going to see you in the middle. Some people used to dance in the middle. A gentleman called Stan Shippey and a lady called Iris Kane. One of the only couples I ever saw at that age who I didn't think I could beat. And I didn't think I could beat them because these two people were mature, sophisticated, assured, stylish, everything that you would want to see. Beautifully groomed, beautifully presented. No presentation in the sense that we would talk about now. No posing, no pouting, no feeling. But my God, what beautiful dancing. I just hope, ladies and gentlemen, that through discussions such as this, that we might be able to get away a little bit from this disparity between Borum and Latin. The criteria are simple. The values are pretty much the same. If we impose an artificial value on the cosmetic effect, that is our fault. It need not be. But I guarantee to you that every couple who comes on this floor this week, if some look strange, if some look peculiar, if some look outrageous, they are only doing it because that's what they think is going to be successful.
I hope that we can change that idea a little bit. Thank you very much. A lady who with her partner...